All right, director's commentary for season two. I guess that makes me the director. Uh, I I kind of do all the I wear all the hats on this project. Um, I shoot it. Uh, I'm the sound guy. I direct it. Uh, I edit it and I score it. So the music right now and all the music through here is stuff that I write for the series. Uh, so every episode's custom scored, actually, which is kind of a neat, weird... It's really an outlier in how film is made, actually, um, unless you're into super high-budget films. Anyway, um, it's kind of got a slow pace. Uh, season 2, again, kind of really embraced um, the experience of, of being outside with the slowness. That's something I've always kind of tried to do. So, uh, you know, slow cuts, slow scenes, and um, because that's kind of, especially in this case, how he's fishing. Ice fishing is slow. Uh, ice auger, fun. It survived. Um, we've had ice augers break on that lake in multiple seasons, and this was once where it worked. Um, why we've been jinxed on that front here, I have no idea. Uh, Spray Lakes is something that, uh, I don't know, we keep going back to it, and I've been starting to question uh, why, but watching this footage, it, it's a good reminder of why the the landscape is stunning and the fishing is hard. So it's kind of one of those t places where, um, you know, you... You win both. I remember talking to the guys actually after this shoot, uh, and they were really dejected because they got their butts handed to them um, while they were fishing. But uh, I was winning so hard every day just on the cinematography and so happy with um, what I was getting uh, content wise that I was just thrilled. Uh, and actually, on a, an aside on that, this is the step out of DSLR filmmaking for me. This would be the first episode ever that I picked up a cinema camera from Canon. Uh, and so that was a pretty big change. Um, so visually, if you're wondering why From the Wild Season 1 looks and feels considerably different uh, than Season 2, that would be one of the reasons. Uh, another reason is that the audio integration, how, how audio is recorded um, on cinema cameras is way better than on DSLRs, which are notoriously bad for audio workflow. So we were able to actually capture great sound of the ice cracking, and like in this scene actually right here. Uh, where the cr ice cracks right under Jeff as he's letting letting fish line out, um, we actually I was actually able to capture that stuff properly uh, from this episode forward, and actually have been largely using um, the same camera actually uh, since then uh, for quite a few seasons. Um, did a very significant uh, audio upgrade on season five, so that's some of the the tech boring stuff that um, that some people might want to know, and lots of people you won't want to know. So. This is uh, something to pay attention to is, or, or that I should offer some um, insight into is kind of what we're using for gear. Uh, the, the knowledge that we received at thus far till this point was that tube jigs uh, were the way. Ah, big pivot switch. That is a burbot dying. And um, up until this point in the series, we'd shown a lot of uh, bleeding animals and animals being gutted. It was really important to me personally to start uh, to show what happens when you're fishing and hunting after the the trophy rack shot um which is why kind of this this series was born to begin with is to explore kind of what happens after that uh field dressing uh skinning and um and the cookery which is kind of what we've we've always focused on uh but this burbot was dying on the ice and we hadn't really caught anything till that point and the guys said to me you can't show that that suffering and that awfulness of that burbot dying on the ice and that really struck me that that's so not okay that uh, that we we let these fish suffocate to death over a very long period of time just kind of as a cultural norm of how you terminate the ice fishing experience once a fish is iced and that that's okay that we would pay so much attention to the ethical handling of all other species in agriculture and then think nothing of fish so that's a theme that shows up later and there's a heavy lesson in what's happening right now with john on screen he had just gone, we'd been failing a lot, looking for walleye and stuff, and any fish, and he went to a, a fisherman who was nearby and asked them point blank, like, hey, you're having some success, what are you using? And um, they said, put a minnow, you're using a, uh, a white jig on the end of a, uh, a jig head, just swap the rubber jig out for uh, a minnow. And we thought, well, that can't really change anything. And instantly it changed everything, and we were able to catch all kinds of fish on this lake, and um, and it, and there's two lessons there. One, 
is that uh, don't be afraid to ask uh, somebody that's on the ice about you know what they're using. If you need a piece of gear, they're likely more than willing to share. Um, and what you know, just kind of t- to share information, and uh, and you'll likely end up with great results. And then secondly, uh, is that despite you know walleye notoriously liking a white jig in this lake they don't they prefer a minnow on it and you have to kind of figure out what that water body what that species uh likes in that water body it will change from lake to lake or stream to stream we just iced the biggest perch these are the biggest perch we've ever caught in the series actually they're like pound and a half perch uh they're just gigantic we weren't targeting them we were targeting the walleye and the odd time we'd pull out a lunker perch so turns out lesser slave lake has some some large yellow perch in it uh and i know zero people that actually fish uh, lesser slave for those perch maybe that's why they're still lunkers i'm just kind of to lesser slave in general um why lesser slave it's the nearest large lake uh near us and then they've also shut down the commercial fishery on it Uh, a number of years ago there's no commercial fishery in Alberta anymore which has meant that what was already a strong fishery is now just an amazing fishery uh, because because there's just no commercial pressure Um, when people don't know how to start the ice fishing uh, endeavor my advice to them is uh, one it's the it's the most accessible uh, hunting fishing activity you can do Um, but the the approach recommendation is uh, find the largest lake that's near you and then step two is go there and see where the ice fishing shacks are and where people are fishing and that's where you want to fish and then uh do you need an auger probably not there's probably holes people are no longer using or have left or or you can chip open um and then if you take a look at the gear that john's using oh he's using a slip bobber like that costs nothing or very little and then the line and the lure which is just a jig head with a minnow on it costs very little and uh you could say about yeah, rods and tents and whatever and i'd say nah you don't need a rod and you don't need a tent um we generally well often don't use a tent and and often uh don't use a rod my preference my favorite way of catching fish is hand lining fish anyway because i really enjoy feeling them um, feeling the action on my hands and it's also it's really doable i've hand lined the biggest fish i've ever caught which was a 24 and a half pound pike um that was completely hand lined no rod uh so you can absolutely you know pull fish up that with your hands and i really recommend you give it a shot so season two i think we were really really excited uh just kind of in general about the the series and and kind of some some of the wins that we'd had both in production and just in the wild food exploration um so there's a lot of episodes this is the most episodes i think in any season from the wild i think there's 14 episodes so um because we had uh we were on three different ice fishing trips we just filmed them all uh i've since abandoned that and and i would never do three uh ice fishing episodes in a season again but uh fun to look back on how different uh lesser slave is this is we're in saskatchewan now and the, the waters are there is clear um lesser slave is murky um and we have traditionally had a lot of luck in saskatchewan with just kind of fishing in general um this was a fun trip this was just me and john uh jeff wasn't able to make it on this one and uh we did pretty well uh on this whole trip there's one kind of poignant moment i don't know if it's in here actually where i was actually frying fish i had like we were having like i don't know not shore lunch but ice lunch and uh frying fish and landing fish while i had the frying pan frying Uh, which was something I can't say I've done since then. Um, Catching pike on rods again. And here, here's a really gorpy setup. I wouldn't, this was back when I didn't know what I was doing. See the size of those hooks? We were after big pike or hoping to catch big pike. So I just went and bought like big gear. There's a decent sized fish. That first one was probably four or five pounds. That one looked like he was eight to 10. Um, But those big, huge hooks don't get impaled into them very easily. So on this trip, um, you know, we were doing our best as we always are doing and continue to do, but, uh, our fail rate was really high because we were kind of using gear that they, that wasn't hooking them well. Now, one thing to know about Pike is what that Pike's trying to do right now is he's trying to grab that, that fish and he's not trying to eat it head first. You'll notice he's always hitting it broadside. And we've noticed that over the years that that's how a Pike takes bait. They whack it broadside. So if your hook set or your, your bait, um, Sorry, if the hook's pro- I just noticed, got distracted by John's bleeding hands. Um, 
from dealing with Pike. Oh, I almost died here. This is one of the few moments where it was dangerous that I almost went head first down an ice fishing hole. Um, we made them, we thought it'd be cool to dig uh, or drill three holes next to each other. We actually did four holes next to each other and that was a really poor idea and I recommend that you never do that. <laughs> never do that. Uh, but to go back to gear, we've caught the biggest pike um, ever uh, on really small treble, uh, treble hooks and with a different technique that I'll cover later down the road and we actually kind of show that. So here we caught three decent sized fish, but we had lost 80% of them because we were just kind of fishing them wrong. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah, you know, it's something I'm kind of missing doing and probably will go back to is we used to go to restaurants a lot in season one and two. We'd head back into the city with whatever we tracked down and in the field and, and visit some chef friends. And th in this case, this is Chef Blair Lebsack from Range Road. Um, Blair is a, a highly revered Canadian chef. Um, and some things that I wouldn't normally do, I wouldn't normally scale a pike and then clean it. Uh, I think that was a 12 pound fish, uh, if I recall properly. So just, there's a few, there's lots of things actually to take away from how, how Blair's about to manage this. Um, a bench scraper, I've since gone and I, I always use a bench scraper when managing pike, mostly for slime management, but also scales for keeping your work surface clean. Really, really important. And then notice how he didn't dig his knife all the way into the guts and like bust them open with his knife. There's just a detachment point back at the back end of the, of the fish and a detachment point at the front end. And well, I mean, it's important to, to say that the, we've never really um, overthought the series and maybe, you know, we, we uh, lose in some at some points because of that. But in some cases we win. In, in kind of the authenticity and, and, and genuine kind of, uh, you know, sharing of our experience in our journey. So in this case, uh, where I'm going with that is that uh, Blair and I looked at each other and said, well, let's just put the fillets away. Like there's, so, we were both kind of commenting on, look at all the cool stuff that is edible out of this fish. Um, this is actually, sorry, I keep hopping around. Blair's de-skeening. Uh, he's taking the skein or the, uh, the sack all out of, off of the row something I, I had never seen before. And um, so Blair and I put the fillets away and he made this, that beautiful dish out of all the stuff that would normally hit the garbage bin. That's an important concept, like really important and I'm not sure I can emphasize it enough. So that is like scraped meat, head meat, roe, uh, liver, like all the stuff that you wouldn't normally eat. And apparently ice fishing season's over, and we're into what I call mud season, or the great brown. It's the brown season here, um, which is generally April. This is probably shot in April. Um, my buddy Brad, uh, who I've worked with on other projects, uh, he, uh, he used to be a trapper. He didn't get a job at the local grocery store when he was a kid. He trapped uh, because it was in his family heritage. His grandfather was a trapper and his father trapped and so he knew how. So this little wetland in this ag area around where his family farms held beavers. So we, he showed us how to trap them. Um, but we were foraging for uh, uh, with balsam poplar or black poplar buds to make uh, beaver bait because the stuff I'd picked up from the trapping store was, was working okay. But Brad said, well, I have, I have a recipe for for beaver bait that works better, which is just castor gland and mashed up castor gland and uh, balsam poplar buds. So that's what we were doing in that scene. Now, Jeff had gone on a bender uh, quite a number of years ago before I met him, uh, shooting beavers, I guess, controlling, uh, controlling, uh, dealing with beaver populations in farmland uh, areas and had actually put up an, a, a meaningful amount of beavers that and had a trapper license and I think, you know, and taken the course and all that kind of stuff. So um, Jeff has more than uh, an ancillary knowledge on the topic of beavers. He's done it a lot, uh, but had never trapped them. He'd always shot them. That's a castor gland. Those are dried up castor glands from a beaver. The castor gland is the stinky business uh, that you have to try and avoid getting into the meat part. But when you're making bait, um, that's what you want to use. In this case, these were desiccated like crazy and that was not, Brad wasn't even sure if they'd work because they were so dry. Um, but, uh, they're, they're actually, uh, very expensive. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even want to guess how many dollars, uh, those castor glands would cost, but it's, I mean, when we're talking like, I'm going to guess 40 to $60 for, uh, castor gland and I could be wrong. 
Um, and there's value in beaver in a lot of ways in the pelt and in the, the carcass for especially for bear uh, bear baiting guides uh, and then there's the castor gland and so he's, he's mincing up uh, a relic of an old castor gland that was hanging in the trapping shed uh, to try and, and make that uh, bait that I was telling you about so back to the ponds we went and Brad shows shows us how to make traps or how to set traps which is kind of interesting um, because you're like many things, uh, trying to uh, create the illusion to a beaver that there's another beaver that's in its in its hood and, and going to take over uh, some territory or dominance. So, um, yeah, Jeff was really keen to set traps. Uh, I was really just keen to see if, we, if beaver was food. Uh, ultimately, it's all cool to learn about trapping, but... Um, but uh, as you know, the series is about food. We needed to come to a, a time where there was there was beavers to eat. So, um, you know, that's always an uncertainty when you're out in in this kind of endeavor. Is can we even can we even put up food? This is Jeff being a a, a brute as he can as he can be because he's a powerful man and clearing some land to make a beaver a beaver run. Uh, Jeff has coined a term that I really love called uh, beavertivity which is where you, the, the place where you see beaver activity. So he's trying to make it look like there's been some beaver activity here, and then he's going to set his trap. Um, I don't think we're going to get the, this far in the director's commentary, but the kind of the spoiler is that Jeff did catch, um, trap his first beaver in this episode, which is really cool. Uh, so that was kind of a fun, a, fun, a fun outcome for him, and, um, you know, and just kind of a... I don't know, a new, a new level up in in different methodologies of how you catch a particular species. So, uh, looks like we skipped ahead. That is a gallbladder oh, and liver off and lungs off a beaver. So that's uh, that's pretty interesting. Um, again, this was a really important component in my mind to from the wild is is not gratuitously showing blood and guts, uh, which I guess this exactly is. Um, it's more normal about normalizing and uh, yeah I guess that normalizing this stuff so that this this shouldn't be hard to watch as a meat-eating individual he's currently breaking the tail off the back set of loins and tenderloins on a beaver and yes beavers have one have two sets of tenderloins and loins one uh, in front of their pelvis and one behind which is very not normal but they are a uh, an aquatic rodent after all um and the beaver tail was something that we've we've played a bit with i don't know a lot about still to this day but uh we have cooked beaver meat quite a bit um but anyway blood and guts trying to trying to make it you know not gross um my kids have seen it and been exposed to it since they were little little wee ones and i just really wanted people to have an understanding of what you know how this this works when we take an animal and make it into food Jeff looks like he's being disrespectful right now. We're dis disrespectful, but um, he's actually just marveling at how blobular and wiggly and that a beaver is, yet can be so strong to move a tree the diameter, you know, of I don't know, a big stump. So it's they're pretty remarkable little critters. All right, skipping ahead, we're at my wood oven in my backyard uh, that Blair and my stepdad helped me build a long time ago that's just clay in there it's not a fancy dome the, it's the the oven itself is just mud uh the facade is brick at the front so we had uh asked Braden, chef Braden kozak a good buddy of ours uh from three boars and wishbone and now Hido in the city here to uh come over and just see what he could do with some beaver and now it's one of the kind of realizations, maybe this was the season that it happened, was that, um, you know, Brayden has pretty amazing culinary skills, but had he ever worked with balsam poplar buds, which he's sniffing right now to try and figure out? No. Had he ever worked with beaver? No. Is it even close to anything that he would have received from a local farm? No. So, and he's picking wild onions right now in one of my favorite spots that I take a lot of chefs when they're just kind of checking out the foraging in the river valley here. Um, but the point is, is that we discovered over time that even though these, these culinary experts had a tremendous amount of expertise, we were throwing them for a pretty major loop by giving them ingredients like uh, a rodent or, um, you know, tree buds that 
that they just, they just wouldn't have any experience with any more than we would. And, in, and as the years went on, we found that we had uh, more experience with these ingredients than they did. So the, the benefit here from Braden would be um, about technique, about knowing you know, how much fat should be in that pan, what, what should the temperature be of that pan. Uh, what cuts of meat does he want to use at that temperature? Those are those are decisions that he can do instinctively, um, that take time to learn as a cook, uh, and that's where the kind of value is for us still to this day to have chefs out, as they'll have technique uh, that we don't have um, because they do it every day, day in day out, and we'll have ingredient knowledge that they don't have because we do the wild food thing day in day out. So. Um, so yeah, so Braden got to play with some fun ingredients here. Uh, I had some overwintered leeks in my garden, which just means they survived the winter and we were able to use them. Uh, that is a beaver head and uh, he's about to cook it. You know, like full disclosure, this cookery scene is funny for me to look back on because it is the, for whatever reason, whether it's because it was trapped or the water body it was trapped in or because of um, back to how how it died um, you know I, I just can't say I we I still to this day don't know why that was the most disgusting beaver we've ever eaten it was awful and it was our first kind of go at it and that's not because it was Braden's fault um, it's just it didn't really turn out uh, there's a big dramatic scene going on and I'm yapping about beaver anyway so we failed at beaver cookery uh, we have since figured it out. We figured it out in season three, four. So like big time where it's, it's like excellent, but you need to know some things about beaver. Uh, Jeff is about to harvest, uh, what we call golden bear, which is, uh, um, a very, what I've learned is a very rare color phase of a black bear at the time. It seemed like whatever, you know, <laughs> it must be common cause we got one in season two, but haven't seen anything even close to that, uh, for many years since. Um, a few important things to know here, uh, well, well, one is that we've hunted this line a lot and I've had quite a few experiences on this line since then, uh, this cut line. Um, in this scene, John was going to be our primary shooter with a, with a bow because Jeff and I both wanted to see that happen, but John made the call of uh, the wind is wrong for me and um, so there's no way that I can stalk up to it or he'll, the bear would smell him. So then Jeff had to uh, make a move. Now the bear's way down the line. And again, creatively, you know, this is the director commenta commentating. Um, it, it, you'll notice that I'm on the, I'm on this, the hunters. I'm more interested creatively. You can see the bears moving at the back of the frame there if you want to rewind it, but th that, that's kind of the point. I wanted to see Jeff, Jeff uh, the human and his experience, not, the bear, the animal, and it dying. That has, uh, is both, I'm going to admit, difficult to show if to have a really long lens on an animal and then you wait until the, the shooter's asking the camera guy, you got it, you got it, you got it. We just didn't want to go down that road ever. I, and I didn't think that was the important story to tell. I knew it was difficult to achieve anyway. And, and it's also more gory. I mean, you're going to, so there, Jeff just put a shell into a bear. And he just put another one into the bear. And, um, you know, did I want to see that bear recoiling in its injury and its death? Like, not really. Some people do. Uh, I'm just that artsy dude that doesn't, that never did. So, um, so there you go. Cameras on them. And it's really bugged some people that are viewers that, and, uh, they kind of wish that we showed that. And I, I'm just here to tell you, it's just not going to ever be the, the focus of the show is watching an animal get killed. Now, so there's the strangest, it looks cinnamon here. It looks more cinnamon with the color grade, but that the coloration on the, on that bear is actually really, really blonde, um, which is, I guess kind of, I didn't realize how misrepresented that was in the, in the film. Um, and maybe it had something to do too with the, the process of um, it getting tanned, but the hide is like super blonde. Uh, so yes, here we go. This is gory, but this is how you pull the windpipe and lungs and heart out of a big game animal. Like it's just, this is how it's done. And Jeff does tens of thousands of these in his career, um, every week so that people can eat beef and pork. Uh, so, you know, gory, yeah, sure. Uh, relative to our sanitized, uh, approach to looking at how we obtain our meat, but 
Um, you know, otherwise, no, he just did exactly what you do when you feel dress an animal. And then they had to haul it out like a half a kilometer, uh, just back to the vehicle. So uh, this was the most sensible method at the time to do that rather than to drag it out. Uh, so kind of a rare, uh, this was one of those uh, episodes after quite a f shooting quite a few where we had uh, an animal down on day one. Um, really not, <laughs> not the norm till that point. And really, I think the, uh, if you've watched the series at all, and I guess you have, or you wouldn't be watching this and wouldn't be listening this far in, uh, the, we've always had the kind of social contract with our families, uh, which has recently evolved way down the road. But back then it was three days in the field and that's it. We're not committing any more time to the field production of the series. So to get something down or a fish or a bear or whatever harvested and put up a plate, we only had three days to do that, including our travel time to location. So um, something to kind of consider relative to, you know, slaying it or not slaying it or big animals or not big animals. We just were looking for food uh, within that time frame. This episode, we're in BC. Uh, John used to be a fly fishing guide up in the Arctic and um, he's really good at it as you can see, and I'm not. And at this point, I had uh, never fly fished. And this is the exact stream and the exact location where I fell in love with it. Now, I didn't fall in love with it in the sense that I like, that's all I do now. I just love fly fishing. I'm a hardcore fly fisherman. That, there's an entire like subculture related to fly fishing that I absolutely don't, uh, wouldn't associate necessarily with. Not because I, I disrespect them at all, or, or just it's just I do too many other things. I'm just not a hardcore fly fisher guy. However, um, this trip really did sell me on the beauty of stream fishing, I guess, maybe specifically. And also, I love trout. I love salmonids in general. So accessing trout in this way rather than through a lake uh, was really dynamic. It was fun. The water's moving. You've got kind of the audio sensory therapy happening. And I'm in bare feet and it's lovely out. We're not on, you know, ice fishing in 100 feet of water. You can pretty much see the fish. <laughs> and so John's teaching me how to cast, which, you know, it's taken me a lot of years to not be brutal at. Um, and then... Uh, yeah, and then I caught fish here, uh, and I guess that's kind of what it takes to get hooked, is just a little taste of success, enough that it makes you go, oh, that's cool, you can be in a place this beautiful, doing something this chill, um, and then actually catch something that is really exciting to catch, uh, in this case, rainbow trout out of this little river, I think this is called Granby River, uh, way upstream and down by Grand Forks down in southern BC. Uh, I was on a project. Actually, we were heading to see Jen Cockrell King to go sockeye fishing, which we're going to cover here. But um, this was kind of en route. I had to stop here anyway, so John and I uh, spent some time. Now, that's that's forest fire. That ain't, that ain't cloud time lapse. That's forest fire. And this entire episode um, is, uh, you know, there's a central theme of forest fire. We... Were we couldn't get to where we were going. We couldn't go see Jen because of forest fire to the south. We couldn't go west because of forest fire. Um, and we eventually got, you know, booted out of town. We were having breakfast at a place. And uh, this lady who was our waitress was like, you guys got to get out of here. And so um, I guess this is it. We're, we're booting it out of there. And we had fires. The only highway out, there was a forest fire there too. So we're hauling butt trying to get out of this area you can see the smoke before the forest fire completely cuts cuts off all of the accesses to this part of british columbia and uh yeah so kind of a um you know when we launch ourselves into the field of shooting episode you kind of don't know what you're going to get and uh, this is a perfect example of that in that we didn't know that we were going to get encircled by uh, forest fires and there's some shots here i think where you get to actually see that um on our way out uh, even though we were, <laughs> even though we were trying to escape it and there was ash on my vehicle, uh, we still ended up passing right by the fires within, you know, we could point the cameras at it, which was kind of scary, but we did stop and, and point the cameras at the fire that was burning, that was almost shutting down the highway. I think there it is. It's coming up here. Yeah, there it is. So that's how close the, we were to being in, in completely encapsulated by, uh, a forest fire in this episode. Uh, shortest episode ever uh, for that reason we just kind of couldn't 
see it through. So I think that episode ran into the 19 minute range, which was not what we were targeting. But So we're now after a very gigantically long detour. You can see the fires burning in the back hills uh, around uh, a Soyuz Lake. Uh, we're with Jen Cockle King, a good friend of ours. And we're sockeye fishing with, uh, the fishery had been shut down, but we were with indigenous folks who were able to fish um, and show us around uh, the fishery uh, because they, their fishery is managed differently than with than the recreational fishery. So you could see there's trawling boats back there. There was I was filming um, them netting uh, the sockeye as they come up all the way from the ocean, um, all the way in. We're like 1,300 kilometers or something like that. I'm gonna get that wrong, but it's over a thousand kilometers I think um, of run from the ocean to get this far inland that these sockeye come to spawn and it's taken um, a lot of years uh, for a lot of people to be able to get them to a point where there's actually a fishery again uh, for both you know recreational but also the indigenous folks that used to rely on salmon up in these these parts of the world uh, for a lot of years there were basically no salmon or, or at least a, a very minimal amount you'll notice he bled the fish that is a technique that a lot of the the pro folks do um that is just again not in our kind of in our culture which i wish it was as recreational fishermen that's why we will advocate for it forever the proper killing and handling of fish um much as you would any other animal um so yeah i mean bonking them on the head we learned i would say ice fishing is completely insufficient especially with perch i've seen them flop a day later out of the water, I'm kidding you not, where you think, there's no way, how did that fish possibly survive? Uh, but they last a lot longer than you'd think uh, in certain circumstances. So I've really come to believe in uh, bleeding, not just as a means of, you know, better, higher quality uh, of the fish proper, but um, actual just, uh, you know, ethics of, of uh, ethical kill. John's happy he'd never caught a sockeye to this point. Um, John, again, having been a fishing guy, has caught a lot of fish, so he was pretty keen to run the gear. Uh, we are both quick to, <laughs> to criticize um, downrigger trolling with a guide because as a fisherman, you really don't do anything. You really just reel in the fish with the kit that your guide handed you once he hooked the fish and found the fish and <laughs> did all the work to get the fish. So John was really keen to like r actually run the downrigger gear and 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 learn because um otherwise it can be a pretty boring experience uh and we've kind of i've i've since switched to to mooching gear for uh, all kind of sal salmonids in this instead of this style of, of fishing which has become kind of the norm i grew up um what's called mooching and and uh and then downrigger fishing became popular probably 10 or 15 years after uh i started fishing for salmon and then uh and then i, I lost interest and only recently figured out why um, but it works and it's easy to control your depth and it's easy for guides to be consistent and get results and that's kind of you know the point I suppose um, I would just challenge you as a fisherman that if you're using this methodology that uh, you know I'm sh if you're not aware of mooching um, you know maybe give it a try and uh, it, I think a lot of people agree that it's a pretty fun way to go and we'd escape the forest fires to get the gens but uh, the the Okanagan Valley was burning at the time so um we were we went from forest fire to forest fire to forest fire on this trip which was really weird actually in hindsight and thankfully we haven't seen another season like this uh since but um but it made for <laughs> it made for a memorable trip and uh we did really well with the sockeye i think we caught our limit it's one of those things that you do once you find the i don't know if there's a couple hundred thousand fish down there uh in a gigantic school um, once you lay into them, you know, it's not hard to catch a few and, and be in and out. Now, as far as cookery, um, I do a lot more cookery now. Uh, I did a lot co less cookery back then. And uh, we had the opportunity, uh, which was kind of really uh, rare, and we, this is, I think, the only episode we've ever done it. Uh, the indigenous folks that we were meeting with, we had... The opportunity to have them show us how it was done by one of the older knowledge keepers in the in the community i mean there's a lot for me to say about that i mean it's it's an honor it's an honor to have his knowledge shared but there's a lot that's hard to communicate regarding like uh, i get asked why we don't have indigenous people on the show more often for example uh 
one of the reasons is because I'm a firm believer that Indigenous folks should be telling Indigenous stories. Um, uh, that took me a while to kind of come around to, but I really do get that. Um, and as, uh, you know, a white dude, it's pretty uh, obvious to me that uh, I can be respectful and, and uh, interested and keenly interested and have my heart in the right place, but ultimately uh, these are traditions that are um, in some cases closely held and um, and kind of no matter which way you dice it should be left up to the up to these people to to share um, their knowledge and stories so um, I think you have to tread that water carefully kind of always and especially if you're in my situation as a, a pointer of a camera for a living um, just really have to be not mindful of of which of these stories you you take on and 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 share um, because it's the right set of circumstances and then which you just don't even bother touching not out of disrespect but out of respect for letting um, those communities share their own stories anyway enough about that that's my position on it in this case this is one of the knowledge keepers this gentleman here uh, in the community and I it blew me away because he's a young guy and uh, asked him why kind of you know again out of kind of uh, humble ignorance well how is it that you're so young and and know so much about all this all this history of your people and uh they this community the penticton band had um not lost a generation to residential schools so they had had continuity in their uh knowledge sharing and they were a very highly educated uh successful contemporary uh modern like successful businesses in the community uh community uh, first nations community and um I found that really eye-opening. Um, I've had the opportunity to film in residential schools and, and I've filmed a number of Indigenous stories. So it was nice to meet a, a community that had um, not had to deal, uh, maybe that's the wrong word, but had not succumbed to um, the full de- you know, uh, consequences of that situation, which is an awful one. So... Um, anyway, salmon, they're cooking, um, if you're wondering, the, this is not Chinook they're cooking, or sorry, this is not sockeye that we caught. Um, we went home with that. They had Chinook and they had some other salmon that they had, uh, caught that they were cooking up for a big, a big kind of, uh, I don't know, a gathering. Uh, just they invited some friends and colleagues. And skip ahead, there's an elk down. Um, and that's me and one of my hunting mentors, um, my basically my dad's best friend uh managing an elk on opening day uh i've done a lot of elk uh, i shouldn't say a lot because elk hunters are hardcore i've done some elk hunting um elk are remain one of the most elusive big game animals that we chase they are really difficult to hmm they're difficult to track down they're like the ghost of big game in the forest I've, now, that said, we're not calling. We're actually just walking in on them and interception hunting them here. Um, I would love to spend some time calling at some point in the future. I think that'd be an, a heck of an exciting way to approach um, el- the, uh, an elk hunt. But in this case, um, we had just walked in on a place where they, we, they were known to be and known to be feeding and traveling and got in, uh, you know, on, on a... I don't even know what the right word is. This is a grazing lease that we just walk in on a road that's not a road. It's just like a quad trail and uh, intercepted this this bull. Um, this was not my tag, not my shot. I didn't shoot that animal. So I went home with uh, the offal because that's not a very popular thing in a lot of circles. So there's some heart going on to uh, a grill with some apple. And this is uh, Chef Alan Sudeby who's doing the cooking uh, for me uh, for camera. Is uh, Again, I do a lot of cooking, but it's actually, believe it or not, really hard to... Of all of the parts of the show to produce, cookery segments are actually tough because there's a lot of shots and there's a lot of steps. And if you miss any, you know, any of the key steps, it kind of becomes disjointed. So I would say, um, you know, the the post-production on cookery segments is tough. And so and shooting them is not easy either. So if I can have somebody else do the cookery, that's that's a lot easier for me. Uh, lately I've been choosing to do it, um, myself a lot more, which is, which is hard, but, um, getting better at it slowly. 
Uh, so again, uh, Alan Sutterby, that was heart. He pulled it off um, on the rare side. I'd recommend if you're grilling heart, you don't cook it all the way through. Um, he's making a gastrique out of some honey and some apple cider vinegar, I think, from my cider production. Uh, a gastrique is a culinary thing that you, I'd recommend you try if you don't know what it is. Um, it's it's kind of a sweet and sour vinaigrette hot thing. So there he is adding the vinegar. Um, and I guess I've just described what it does. It brings kind of that sweet and sour vibe to uh, to a savory dish really quite easily. So he's just finishing the pan uh, in that way. So again, it's called a gastrique. It's a French term. Uh, I've, cons- I've compared it to like a, a hot vinaigrette. But I would, I've had to kind of check myself on that. It's not, not exactly. It's, it's really more about the sweet and the sour and some savory. This is Alan foraging for some horseradish behind my garage in the back alley. And uh, there's an under, underappreciated uh, wild food. Uh, that, that does grow wild in a lot of our province. And I know a few spots to find it, but, um, but it certainly doesn't get used to the extent that it should uh, you know, you think about how ubiquitous um, wasabi is in Japanese cuisine. Oh, I gotta stop. Look at the doneness on that. That's your target right there. Ellen nailed that. And while that might look too rare to you, if you don't really love rare meat, I think you really, with heart, you really need to try it that rare. Um, and you'll you'll see what. Maybe a bit more than that. Okay, I'll admit that maybe that's a bit rare, but um, for somebody who's averse to rare. But if you can handle handle it, that's a great way to eat it. Um, sorry, I got sidetracked. Uh, sweet, sour, savory, gastrique, not some, there it is. There's the gastrique going on, uh, and nodding onion going on at the end. That was a good dish. And apple, roasted apple and horseradish. So yeah, ubiquitousness of, of wasabi, um, the ubiquitousness of chili in so many, uh, cuisines and in North America, or at least in Alberta, we have horseradish, which is completely, in my opinion, it's not even like a... A compromise or a, we, you know like we have to make do with it it's like horseradish is great so uh we need to we need to use it even more but i mean I think people in general need to use it more there's hank shaw shooting shooting birds and man that guy's one heck of a good shot he's can't really see but he's laying down birds as he's shooting there walking them up um we're down in the grasslands uh this is hank's first visit there he's shooting ducks boom um, Hank's first visit ever. I'd known Hank. Uh, fun fact is that I, uh, when I started blogging way back a long, long time ago, uh, Hank was one of the com- first commenters or, or frequent commenters on my blog. And I remember um, way back then he was a political journalist. And I remember people saying, oh, Hank, you should, you know, you should have a blog. He's like, no, no, no. And then look at him now. He's like a award-winning multiple book author in the wild food space with an extremely act where all he does for a living is wild game cookery, uh, recipe writing and and um, and kind of living in this kind of a similar space that I do. It's just I do uh, moving picture and he does um, and he forces me to drink Molson Canadian on camera. He he, <laughs> he required this scene. He's like, we have to do this. I was like, oh my God, you were going to do this? That's embarrassing. It's crappy beer. Made out of high fructose corn syrup and rice probably. But anyway, um, we had spent some time in the grasslands uh, to shoot some waterfowl. So we have a waterfowl episode in this season. Um, but we ended up uh, not butchering them there. Oh, no, we did butcher them there. But we needed to cook them here uh, back up in bush camp. And it's, I have to back up because I thought we were going to cover it. Uh, I did, forgot which scenes I'd included, but um, that is a headless goose because of the way its head was wrung. <laughs> uh, we butchered geese and ducks back there. Oh, the point was this um, This is the first time Bush Camp was born in this season on the Golden Bear Hunt. Uh, we needed a place to stay for the night and John was the person who said, hey, how about right here, like back tucked in this little spot that we were at. I was like, oh, fine. And we've been going back there ever since. So this would have been the first fall bush camp ever uh, in in our camp, which is really neat to look back on uh, a number of years later. Um, so this is Hank. Actually, those trees are considerably bigger now, which is funny. 
Um, we, this is Hank butchering a, a, a goose, obviously. Um, and this would have been mid-September, uh, judging but maybe late September. Uh, and Hank notoriously likes to make fun of uh, how cold it is in Canada because he, he lives in Northern California. So um, this would have been uh, maybe Mother Nature uh, giving him some up and coming, some what he had coming. <laughs> if he's going to complain about the cold here, have some cold, Hank. Uh, one of my favorite cookery scenes of, holy, that place has changed a lot uh, in the last few years. Um, one of my favorite cookery scenes, Hank doesn't have a lot of fire cookery experience because of where he lives in California and if you start a fire there you can burn the state down. So I had given him, uh, well, I ditched the grill and gave him a rock. A rock I had picked up in Kananaskis, I don't even remember where or why or when. But uh, on goes the rock onto the heat, that was it, that was the extent of the technology. And I'd been playing with kind of cooking sausages and baking potatoes and stuff on the rocks around a fire, which I highly recommend mucking about with. And so I kind of forced this upon him. Um, probably at the time, to be honest, looking back on this, that was, I wouldn't do that to anybody <laughs> now. But I was naive enough to go, oh, that'd be cool. Yeah, and unless that failed, that rock could have split right now and that goose breast would be in the ash and the coals and Hank would look like an idiot. And uh, thankfully that didn't happen. But uh, again, I was a bit naive back in the day. Uh, I've learned a number of lessons since then. But it turns out that Hank nailed this dish. Um, he's cooking the tenders, I guess, or what are to me the most tough bits on a on a goose. Um, he's cooking them on a stick, like a wiener roast, right there, so that we could have a little meat snack as we waited for the gigantic goose breast to roast. And because he's American, he makes fun of my Canadianness. I'll make fun of his, of his Americanness. Those were uh, one person portion of goose. <laughs> each one breast per person which to me is like an obscene amount of meat which I think is hilarious um, but he got that goose breast roasting and frying on the that uh, that fire and did just a killer job on that dish uh, the reason we were in bush camp was to shoot this episode uh, this was a grouse hunting episode and I knew that Hank was really good at grouse uh, and I wanted to learn some things one of the funny things that we addressed in the episode that really sticks with me is that uh my entire hunting experience until I was about 30 was shooting grouse with a like that's all I did is hunt grouse primarily and we shot them with a rifle with a 22 and Hank's reaction was was shock and dismay because in most of the United States if not all of them it's illegal to shoot a grouse with a with a rifle and they use shotguns and I grew up making fun of people that use shotguns uh, to hunt grouse because you would just fill them full of pellets but as you can see in this bird for anybody who's watching this who doesn't shotgun hunt uh, grouse you use this scene as as the oh yeah right uh, example of when you shoot a grouse with a, a shotgun it needn't be mutilated um, by a, a bajillion pellets so um, you know that that doesn't need to be a thing look at that grouse breast how cleanly Hank plucked that he is uh exceptionally good and i think in this in this episode if you're careful to his words pay attention to the words of like take your time uh when you're plucking a grouse because their skin's delicate and you'll wreck the crap out of them um i remember i i think fondly on this moment this was i think hank mentions he hadn't split wood in 20 years or something like that and he just fire cookery again just not his thing i taught him here in the scene how to feather stick um which is neat and uh, so this was kind of like a, a really rare opportunity uh, for Hank. And, uh, you know, Hank's been with us a few seasons now or on a few seasons. And I would say if there's one thing <laughs> and I think Hank would agree that marks our experiences together is that they're usually putting him in very uncomfortable situations. Um, there are no hotels or guided, you know, or lodges. Um, we're putting him in very rustic bush back country kind of scenarios that um are not as normal when you live in a country that's way more populated like that little camp is in the middle of nowhere and speaking of the middle of nowhere we skipped into kind of the end of the tail piece of of season two which is uh, a trip to sweden um a couple episodes here this was an intriguing uh scenario for me especially at the time i hadn't traveled as much as i have now for work so being in Scandinavia to hunt 
Uh, Moose was really, really, really weird. Uh, just everything, including the fact that the guy's walking with a dog. Um, really unusual. Uh, they're using technology, and you can see the wire on the dog uh, to track them, and the dog will find a moose and then, uh, you know, bark at the moose, and that's how you know kind of where it is. And if the dog just kind of stays in one area, then you go and find your dog and shoot the moose. So this was a technique that they used at the end of their hunt. Uh, we got to push bush with them, which is just walking through the forest with a large group uh, prior to this. But um, hunting with dogs is something for big game. is something that we just generally... Uh, well, it's illegal in Alberta, and I actually just noticed that the regulations changed a bit on that uh, this year um, in some specific areas for some specific type of hunting activities. But uh, here it was just really commonplace and normal to hunt uh, big game with dogs. Again, really they're kind of an eye-opener. Another eye-opener is everywhere we walked, like in that scene, it was with uh, this gentleman who is kind of hosting us. Um, there's berries everywhere. I can't believe the berry scene that Sweden has in this part. We were in Dalsland. Um, and all of the plants and all, like just so many aromatics and so many berries and so many mushrooms and lots of foraging to be done in Sweden because they have, I would say, on the whole, uh, more humidity than we do in Alberta. And again, I don't know this to be the case, but they have a lot of lakes and they're kind of surrounded by the ocean a lot. But compared to, again, being as far inland as we are and how little lake action we have specifically in Alberta where I live so um, yeah really cool opportunity to, to go hunting in Sweden why are we in Sweden uh, he's about to put he's got his scope on a moose running through that scene there and he didn't pull the trigger because they had already had their limit of bulls if it was a cow or a calf he could have pulled the trigger and shot it and in Sweden to get a license you have to be able to shoot a moose on the run like that they put them on railroad tracks you should google that and uh, they put them on like a yeah a rail and then send a moose silhouette going through the, the bush and you have to be able to have a certain shot placement is my understanding um, on a moving moose target to be able to even get a moose license. All very cool. Uh, I don't blame them for doing that, especially if you're going to hunt them that way where you're pushing the bush and the moose are on the move. We're pretty used to, if I'm, I'm going to shoot a moose, it's because it's, it's, it's standing still at the time. Um, we're in Sweden. Oh, this was a touching scene, actually. Jeff got to hang out with a bunch of um, Swedish folks uh, butchering, I think they had six moose to break down. Um, and Jeff just got to kind of hang out and chat butchery with them, which was really, really lovely to be uh, the facilitator of. Um, and this is a, a neat scene about kind of his, this gentleman's grandma's kind of cookery with marrow and that marrow has kind of become a, uh, a lost culinary piece and we had already done it in season one so moose marrow swedish moose marrow season two um why in sweden though uh honestly it's one of those internet related relationships i have or had at the time with a gentleman by the name of uh johan uh, postma and he had a, a lodge in sweden and it was one of those hey you should come shoot something here sometime kind of offers and and the craziness of me just taking him up on it uh so i flew Jeff and John out there and we had just kind of a crazy week um, just you know hanging out with hunters foraging fishing and, and um, dealing with moose and, and roe deer and it, it was weird because I wanted to go there and explore the differences in the cookery of moose that's kind of what I was after I thought oh man they must do some different things and they do, they do tacos and meatballs, Swedish meatballs and things that you wouldn't be, you know, be surprised about when it comes to ground moose meat. But um, what was kind of the takeaway from this whole journey in Sweden was that um, was that it was the hunting of the moose proper that was so different. The, the, the culinary side was more recognizable. It was the, the way that they hunted. And there's lots, we go on a, a lot about it in the episodes, but it was the way that they hunted that was completely different. This is an iconic uh, moment for the three of us who are pretty core members of this series. Um, one of the highlights of the entire series, and, it, I, and I can't exactly calculate for you why. Uh, there's a few that are like that. Um, it, was a, it was a sleepy afternoon, <laughs> and um, we'd been having a lot of fun, and there was some roe deer butchery that we had the opportunity to do. Someone gifted us an entire roe deer. 
And this was the first ficelle, which is just cooking on a string, kind of a rotisserie on a string, that uh, that we've we've done in the series. This was the first of those. We've done a few since, and it's become kind of a uh, a treat for us. It's it's a recurring character on the culinary side, but it it really is something that we look fondly upon um, and get, get excited about if there's if there's a haunch of something to spin on a string over a fire. Kind of means you have enough time to just chill out and hang out while it cooks. Um, and it kind of is just a, I don't know, one of those tradition, it's now it's like a traditional food of the series. It's just a reminder of all of the cool moments that we've had the opportunity to take a hind leg of a deer like this and, um, and roast it over a fire. And that's exactly the mojo, the mood of that afternoon. It was just chill. Jeff and John got to go catch a pike out of the lake that was nearby with a boat that was just sitting there. <laughs> and uh, and then we ate roe deer that had been gifted to us. And roe deer is like a, uh, a small deer, obviously. That's like a, a whitetail fawn size uh, there. So we, we that's why we've done it with whitetail fawns uh, since then. It's kind of the appropriate reason to or the appropriate size uh, to work with um, is that size of animal. So you'll notice John's fancy knife gear here. Uh, he's using the, the classic pocket knife and not some fancy gajillion dollar uh, knife. And that is some beautifully cooked uh, roe deer right there. So yeah, all of this because uh, we just had an, a kind offer from a kind gentleman in Sweden. Um, who loved the outdoors and, and wanted to engage with us. And uh, since that, we've been friends with him ever since. Uh, we kind of changed a lot of, of what he was doing there for his food program. Um, I could go on and on about that for a very long time, but now we're into Blair's very first deer. That's the first deer that Blair ever shot. Um, he wanted to big game hunt. Uh, he was Blair had been engaging with us in the kitchen in the restaurant, but he hadn't yet uh, hunted himself and I think he was tired of hearing all of our stories <laughs> and us bringing him cool things to cook and he wanted to get involved so um I have always joked that Blair has a lot of horseshoes up his butt so this is this is his first ever morning hunting whitetail and I think it took him oh no he had an opportunity in the morning and, and passed uh because he wasn't quite certain what was what what the situation was or how to execute and then uh this was the afternoon so it took all of all of uh maybe six hours for him to get his first whitetail ever um, nice little white tail doe. Uh, this is on John's grandparents' land, uh, not too far from, from Edmonton. So it would be in the kind of Aspen Parkland eco region. Uh, we don't hunt in it a lot, uh, truth be told, because, um, why? Because once you get into the boreal forest, it's, it's like the limitless opportunity to, um, to to hunt you have access to land everywhere if you see a deer you shoot it in this kind of terrain uh you there's private land everywhere so getting permission becomes a heck of a lot more difficult uh this is john guiding blair on how he breaks down uh and guts and field dresses a white tail and it's neat to see that uh there's different takes on it different methodologies this is a uh, one of the larger white tail bucks um that was harvested in the series this was in the winter and oh yeah uh the objective here was that we were going to have a dinner back at blair's restaurant and so we needed some we needed to harvest some meat <laughs> to be able to serve uh and that was going to be the season closer and um so jeff and i went on one of the most awful hunts uh, we've ever been on uh in november because it was darn cold here and this whitetail was one what we were able to harvest before uh, heading back home because it was again just an awful kind of an awful experience um, just too cold to be out in the bush and we just were stupid enough to go anyway um, back at the butchery and back at Range Road so um, again mentioned that we were going to do this dinner at, at Blair's there's the deer that we had harvested and and uh, skulls boiled out and Kevin Kent and Connie and John um, and a whole bunch of friends of the show were there uh, just to have a chef collaboration, just for fun, really. Um, yeah, wild game dinners need to be free in Alberta. Uh, you can't exchange money for um, for tickets as per lots of places. So anyway, there's lots to know about that. If you want to, you know, get learn more about wild game dramas, dinners and problems, that we've had uh, season three continues that that story thread 
Um, it's been an awful part of, of you know, it, it can be awful to do right. Uh, that's Connie and John's Whitetail Meat Pie. Um, we've, they were with us in the next season. Uh, they ended up also being in, intrigued enough into the in the hunting space to come out and join us um, for for a hunt. And uh, Doreen Prize in there. She's a, a, a formerly from or originally from Germany and a really brilliant chef. And I was really happy to have her her join. And there she is. And she put up an awful dish. Actually, it was tenderloin with a liver sauce, and that kind of blew my mind because a liver sauce is something I would never think to make. Um, but her dish was beautiful and um, and tasty and. This whole collaboration was um, just a huge win, uh, and I'm just sitting here really feeling gratitude for Blair for hosting. So there you have it, season two. Some thoughts on that uh, next up, season three.